So what I did is I looked through people who almost all of these, except for one, had an initial and an up and a, um, a status update, and they didn't hit the, the score that it was expected for them to. So I made a I just made some notes on there. Those are a little bit jumbled, and then I pull out the salient features, and then we talk about decision points. So it's one thing if you hear somebody present a case. And they say, I went from this to this to this, and the person does well. Well, it's easy to think, oh, yeah, I would do that. But what about when it, there's decision points in every case? When somebody comes back and they report something to you, they have a certain um, presentation. And then you, what do you do next? And sometimes it's easy to go one way versus another. And so we're going to look at decision points of how we can change. And hopefully that these will help you. When you hit these decision points, you remember um, this presentation. So case one, his primary complaint was unilateral shoulder pain. It was a female in her early 80s. Most of these I tried to put the duration if it was documented. So I'm just going through notes here. I haven't talked to any clinicians specifically about these people. So the durations, that would typically have an indication of how long you would set the goals for. There's a number of um, things we need to just look at for prognosis. Um, including the pathoanatomy, how long symptoms have been there for age, the comorbidities, uh, some of the psychosocial issues, and photo tries to take that into account. Um, and they do a really good job of that actually, typically. But the goals, so I'm taking that from the notes. How long were the goals set for? So we can kind of get an idea of how realistic it is. Um, the person had no copay will put the financial because sometimes that would affect if somebody's coming or not. And then I'll put the where their initial one was. This person's initial one was 63. They went to a 56 during their episode of care, but it expected them to get to a 71. All right, so for this person, left shoulder is weak, painful, and limited in range of motion. Manual therapy to the glenohumeral joint and progressive exercise are the hallmarks of the treatment. And the patient does very well subjectively and as, as I look through all the notes. And so this, the shoulder symptom that she came in for did improve quite a bit, but her photo score decreased. On the last visit, she notices neck pain, um, which is likely why the photo score dropped. It wasn't evaluated before that. She has a different pain there, but the photo score still drops. And so it's a fail on photo, even though what she came in for did quite well, but the same functional activities that she was struggling with are now even a little bit more difficult because of this new symptom. So here's the cross. This one didn't have a specific crossroads, where some of these I'm going to go over have specific time frames or points in time. This one, there was no specific time the neck should have been tested outside of the first session. Typically, we want to do things for session, but I realize we can't get everything done on the first session. Um, but it was, it was very likely not the primary impairment or even the primary pain generator. Otherwise, the person wouldn't have done so well throughout. But as they started loading their shoulder and they were doing more and more, something flared their neck. And if we would have looked at it at first, I would be surprised if they were had full cervical range of motion with overpressure that would have been pain-free initially. And if we would have looked for that and treated that, we likely wouldn't have ended up with this dip in score. And we could have photo would have shown the improvement that we seem to have gotten otherwise. Let's go to case two. So this is an also shoulder pain, male in his early 30s. He'd had multiple surgeries about eight years ago, so in his 20s. And his goals were set for nine weeks away. He didn't have a copay either. He went from 39 to 47 and should have gotten to a 67. Now this one's interesting because he did move early on. Um, he had uh, three sessions into there, so he could have made it all the way there. We don't know. Um, but he didn't in the three sessions. Now the goals were set for nine weeks away and it was documented that he did need more um, visits. So this person may have gotten there. However, um, as we look at it, he's seen a physical therapist before. He's bench pressing 200 pounds, so he's doing exercise. He's told he has osteoarthritis. He'd had, and he just didn't feel like he was getting as much as he wanted. And so then we go through there and we do range of motion and shoulder strengthening exercises, probably not much different than the last physical therapist did. And we're hoping for different results. Now, we did improve somewhat, 
um, but we didn't get the full, even though it was only three sessions, we may have gotten there. But it's an example of when we do need to evaluate the neck. Um, on the third session, he does report that his neck is hurting. If we'd looked at that at the beginning, maybe the 47 would have been better um, that third session, or at least it gives us a better opportunity to get there in the end. Um, this one, we just don't know. He may have gotten to 67 to be a mute point. However, if his neck is hurting, if we'd looked at it, you know, it gives him a better chance to be feeling better in the long term. All right, case three. Unilateral shoulder pain, early 60s female. It only been going on for a month, and this it goes for six weeks away, no copay. She actually dropped from a 57 to a 43. That's a pretty big drop, and it was expected that she would get to a 70. So it said that um, it was documented that she injured herself lifting an object, but she has super scapular pain. So she it was put as shoulder pain in there, but super scapular pain and posterior shoulder pain. Plus, there was C6 myotomal weakness. This is all documented. Pain looking to the left and numbness in the fourth phalange. She also has limited shoulder range of motion, and she's diagnosed with rotator cuff pain by the PT instead of spinogenic. This, I mean, there's a number of evidence of cervical radiculopathy here. Whenever you have peripheral objective findings and spine objective findings, the spine ones are more salient. And this is especially true when there's hard neurological findings. Multiple asterisk signs are needed. That will help you figure out which ones are more salient. But initially, think spine before peripheral. And the required asterisk signs for this person would be cervical range of motion, shoulder passive range of motion, shoulder active range of motion, and shoulder manual muscle testing. This would have given us enough asterisk signs. So when we work the neck, we can see, okay, does just the cervical range of motion get better? Um, does anything in the shoulders get better? Maybe passively it does, but actively it doesn't. Maybe actively it does and passively it doesn't. And then is the manual muscle testing any different? That way we can see what it's helping and what it's not. We can see if we need to move to the shoulder, as we often do in cases like this. So visit two, the patient is worse with the rotator cuff exercises. So here we have somebody with myotomal weakness, symptoms down to the to the fingers and well, what else was it um, and she has pain with looking to the left the ipsilateral so she has pain on the ipsilateral side we give her something for the shoulder and she comes back worse I often find this that if we do something to the periphery and it's coming from the spine that they will feel worse and this is what happened some it's easy to look at it as like okay we overloaded we're too aggressive for the tissue that is rarely the case except for like a hamstring tear you know some things where it's significant pathoanatomy it could be however we're typically not going to make that mistake unless they do it on their own where they add something or they do something that they didn't realize was stressing that tissue as much normally feeling worse is due to missing the diagnosis and often it's treating peripherally instead of central. I've never had a shoulder issue that when it was a primary shoulder issue that with a little bit in the neck that we treated the neck, then the shoulder was worse. But I've had it a lot. If I've treated the shoulder and it was a neck issue that they did get worse. So they added, the therapist added cervical manual therapy, but the direction of the plan of care didn't change. The volume of the rotator cuff exercises for home was just decreased. And since the, the plan never changed, the patient never improved and actually worsened. Case four, primary complaint of this male in his mid-50s was bilateral shoulder pain. It had been there for five months. The goals were set for nine weeks away. The, for financial, the, it was, there had no copay. It went from a 55 to 66. But he was expected to get to a 68. Almost hit it. So this one, he had left and right shoulder pain with limited range of motion and strength on each side. Session five, strength is nearly equal each side. So that's really good. On the ninth visit, it's noted that he has neck pain and he's instructed to get a referral for his neck. The salient features here, sh shoulders improve with focus on the mobility and strengthening. So that was, I mean, that's the main part of the, about the case. But then visit six, his objective measures have improved significantly, but he's still having pain. Since the neck was missed before this, before this, it should be evaluated this session. It is likely not a primary pain generator for his shoulder, but a little work here would have likely would likely improve his perception of his symptoms and his photo score. Case five, 
This one had primary complaint of neck pain and unilateral arm paresthesias. It was a male in his early 30s, pain for at least six months, and the goals were set for eight weeks away, no copay, went from a 50 to 59, expected to get a 68, so about halfway there almost. So he had a radiculopathy pattern, and the pain decreased in the neck and numbness in the arm with traction. So that's a, that's a good sign whenever we get decrease in symptoms with traction. You know, we've seen that before clinically at also in the research, and those people can do very well. Only four of the eight visits was manual therapy performed. Myotomes were not tested until session five, and they were deemed as normal. This is unlikely with the distal symptoms that he had. Um, now, there's a couple, you know, there's a couple reasons that maybe this was the case. Maybe um, they had improved. Typically, myotomes improve before symptoms do. And, but his symptoms did fluctuate. Now, sometimes symptoms and myotomes will fluctuate. I've had people come back and they were better. You know, they're stronger. So we started progressing more and then they came back and they were a little bit worse. Maybe it's something I did. Maybe it's something that happened in their life. Their symptoms are worse and I test myotomes and they d- drop down again. So maybe this person's myotomes have just already improved and they were worse at first, even though we didn't test them and the symptoms just aren't there yet. Um, my, I also wonder though, was it just not tested aggressively enough? Um, we don't know. We don't know which one it is. Um, he did have hyporeflexia when it was tested at the bi, um, I think it was biceps, wherever it was. But uh, so it's, with that, it's highly unlikely that myotomes were actually clear. So visit two was a major point for this patient. He comes back with no symptoms in the upper extremity throughout the session. And so they left the neck and they just did functional things, see if anything flared him up and no, no symptoms occurred. It's very appropriate to say, okay, no symptoms, great. Let's go out and see if any of these things cause symptoms, see how close we are to hitting your goals. And if nothing causes it, you can do that for a little bit. And then you need to go look at the neck and do overpressure in all directions. If that's not clear, you need to treat the neck until that is clear. Otherwise, it's easy for them to flare up, which is exactly what happened in this case. That sometimes he'd be doing better, sometimes he'd be doing worse. And we didn't work to clear the neck. We only treated it when we had to for symptom modification in the session. And the person just kept fluctuating and they didn't reach to where they could have gotten to have a flare-up again. So then again, in visit six, manual therapy was not performed because it wasn't found to be helpful. So over the course of treatment, he'd had up and down with his symptoms. Um, and like I said, after visit two, likely would have had pain with overpressure at the neck. And until that's cleared, it'll be easy for him to fluctuate. Um, and they didn't find that manual therapy was helpful, which is odd because remember the first session it was. So if you're getting something that doesn't make sense, where why would traction, you know, manual therapy that has been helpful, he seems to have good condition pain modulation, he's been feeling good before with things, maybe you're just not getting intra-session improvement, maybe he's done so much that it's chemically inflamed, and that's when manual therapy won't be as helpful, but that doesn't mean at least intercession, intra-session, but intercession, it may be found to have some help. And then we need to go back there again. And this is where asterisk signs. So at this point, we're six visits in, he's been up and down. We don't know really what he needs. We need multiple asterisk signs. Cervical range of motion with sustained overpressure if necessary. So cervical range of motion is a must. If he's having pain at end range, we don't have to go and then crank into it. Um, shoulder manual muscle testing and lifting overhead should have all been performed as asterisk signs here. On some of the other ones we've done, shoulder of active and passive range of motion, doesn't seem like it was a problem for him, at least not significant. It would be more beneficial just to go to that lifting overhead like a shoulder press. And that way we see when we work with the neck, what improves. And we may not get intra, especially if there's chemical inflammation, we're then going to hope for intercession improvement. Case six, unilateral shoulder pain, female in her 50s, been going on for five months, goals are set for eight weeks. She didn't have a copay, she was a 62, you know, that high of a photo, and you know, where she was at with age and everything, you don't expect her to get to a 65, but she actually dropped to a 59. So let's look at this. There was no traumatic mechanisms of injury. It was a gradual onset. Neuro exam was noted as clear. However, I don't know how clear it was because it said, it only documented sensation as being within normal limits. 
objective measures note that there is pain and weakness with strength testing and limited painful passive range of motion. So when we do strength, we need to, it should have been documented as myotomal or strength or unclear. Um, there's no documentation of looking at the neck. Even though, you know, as we've discussed, especially the unilateral shoulder pain, we learn in PT school that we should be assessing the joints above and below, especially when it's no traumatic mechanisms of injury, it's a gradual onset, we need to be looking at the neck. On the third visit, the patient had a new symptom, and then the neck was tested, and UPAs at C5 replicated her new symptoms. And so those are treated on the fourth visit. She didn't have any replication of symptoms of C5 UPAs, and her um, her new symptom was better. Um, but it does note, as they continue to look at that, that it didn't say anything about whether C5 is painful, just that it didn't replicate her symptoms. And then it does note that the T1 spinous process is very sensitive. That is, that, as I'll show you later, is a salient feature. Um, treating, and treating here did improve neck mobility, but not her shoulder press mobility. They also noticed this session that there's glenohumeral joint and AC joint crepitus. That is a salient feature as well, as we'll point out. The rest of the manual therapy was performed on the spine. The rest of treating manual therapy was performed on the spine only sometimes. It was a total of five out of 13 sessions that included spine manual therapy. On the final visit, the patient is discharged due to lack of progress. And it's noted the patient is sensitive to all movement. It also notes the patient would like to lose weight but doesn't have time for exercise. So the salient phase features are crepitus in the glenohumeral and AC joint and sensitivity in the spine. We notice it was particularly at T1, but there may have been other points as well. They put very. She had had times when it was at C5. Um, the shoulders are sore even after decreasing loading. And the therapist did a good job of trying to predict what the patient would respond like. I always like to put predictions, like this is what I anticipate. So if it's not, it's a, it's a flag to you like, hey, this is not going as you thought. So here's, the, here's where the crossroads are. On the third visit, she's worse and not better. The therapist did a good job of recognizing that the neck needed to be evaluated. However, it was appeared, it, it looks like it was just evaluated for the new symptoms she was having. And then the next visit, when it didn't replicate her symptoms, it was viewed as not important. The spine does not have to replicate symptoms to be a primary pain generator. It doesn't have to replicate those familiar symptoms to be a primary pain generator. And it, and it, or at least a primary impairment for extremity pain. So if they have extremity pain and they have neck pain, it could be, or if it's even really particularly stiff, it could be a primary impairment or a primary pain generator, even if they don't replicate their familiar symptoms. Once the spine is found, this should be identified as an impairment, and that should be cleared in future sessions. So it should go until they can do overpressure. You can do overpressure for 10 seconds without symptoms. You want to keep working on that. So fourth visit. So then they come back. It was noted that this goes along with a third visit. These put it as two decision points, but it's kind of one thought process here. Um, that manual therapy improved mobility to the neck, but not didn't improve her shoulder press ability, which indicated to the therapist that it wasn't the sole cause of the pain, but it was a contributing factor. That's what they document, documented telling the patient that. And this is very accurate. But when manual therapy to the spine is all, only perform the next session and then not for multiple sessions after that. This may be appropriate if they're approve, improving, but when they're not, then it could be a misdiagnosis. So it showed that it improved and then they went away from it. It's like they wanted to get away from neck manual therapy as soon as possible. And that's, we don't want to over manual therapy. We don't want to create dependency. We don't want to, obviously active treatment is always better, but it was never documented that cervical range of motion was full and pain-free even with overpressure. If they would have done that, very likely the person could have done a lot better. So then visit six. The patient is sore, even though the last note predicted that she would not be. So visit five, they say, okay, we decrease loading because she was sore. We're anticipating that she will feel better, but then she wasn't. This is a flag we're missing something. We've done the shoulder, didn't work, went to the neck, then we went back to the shoulder, and now we're at visit six. We thought decreasing loading would help, and it's just not. Something is missing. Could be orthopedically, could be psychologically, could be socially, and I didn't put it in here, but also could be systemically. You know, that's when we're starting to think, you know, we're looking at, you know, Lyme disease or MS 
or lupus or something, you know, fibromyalgia. What are we, what are we missing here? This is where we need to look at all the notes to see what we missed. You know, we've gone up and down and it's like, oh, this is not going in the direction that we want. We're not making that steady progress. So then we need to establish multiple asterisk signs. This helps us for the orthopedic issues because right now we don't know where she's at. This person's asterisk sign should have been cervical range of motion. Obviously, if need, we should include overpressure. Shoulder active range of motion, shoulder passive range of motion, shoulder manual muscle testing of the rotator cuff, and shoulder press. She needs a lot. She has a lot going on, and she's not making progress. We need a number of ways to measure, and then she needs to know how we're measuring it as well. And we need to do that consistently. Good questioning is also needed to find out where the patient is at. What if they believe that they can improve? Are they depressed? Do they hear the crepitus and, you know, and say, you know, this is just bringing down my life? Or do they think they need a surgery? You know, where are they at? Are they sleeping enough? Do they have a restricted airway? That'd be more of the systemic, but they're not getting enough oxygen. It's just hard to feel good and hard to have any good kind of condition pain modulation. These are the type of questions that we need to address ask and if they're significantly limiting recovery we need to attack them aggressively we cannot brush them off and maybe they will be attacked uh, attacked by another professional not by us case seven unilateral forearm pain so now we're moving down the extremity a little bit for this case female in her mid-30s been going on for 21 years um, that's a long time for somebody in their 30s and the goals were set for two weeks away is all she had a 46 hour copay which is more than anybody else that we've done so far. She did improve from a 61 to a 65, but it, it expected to a 70. And photo, remember, takes into account that she's had a surgery for this problem, um, which we can see that she's had a surgery connecting the radius and the ulna. Photo doesn't know what surgery was, just that she had a surgery for that problem. Um, it states that the neck was cleared for cervical radiculopathy, but it doesn't say how. So I would be, I would be surprised if they cleared it with overpressure, inflection, and quadrant sustained for 10 seconds on each side, and that they had no symptoms in the neck. I'm, I'm very skeptical of that with, with the whole presentation. So when it says cleared, we, we need to be very clear that we are, know that that is what needs to be done to be clear. It's fourth and fifth digit numbness with full elbow extension with supination, but it doesn't clarify if it's in the ulnar nerve distribution. So it's fourth and fifth. That's when you want to think, you know, is this dermatomal or is it ulnar nerve now if we're looking at ulnar nerve it should be more specific than dermatomal if you're unclear there's at least a component of dermatomal um, to it now it may be a double crush but if it's unclear at least a component of dermatomal is likely if they just get it sometimes and you don't replicate it during the session then you say when you feel it feel each side of your fifth and your fourth phalanges and then notice if both sides of both of them, if you notice those, the numbness sensation. Sometimes then they'll notice, oh, it's only on this side of, you know, the owner's, they won't say owner, but on the owner's side of my fourth phalange. Okay, you know, and on the fifth, it's both sides. Well, then that's a pretty clear ulnar nerve distribution. That's not going to be coming from the cervical spine. So that's how we need to, you know, if it's not clear, then say that we instruct them to do that and they'll come back with it later. Um, it's the, but then they document radial nerve sensation changes, which is quite odd with uh, where they're saying that the symptoms are at. If sensations are descriptive, so that way we know, like, was it consistent? Is it every time you touch a certain spot? Is it throughout the entire area of that, of the radial nerve? Or is it, did you just get it in one spot? Um, so the patient is given radial nerve glides, but these are causing pain by the second session. If it's a peripheral nerve mononeuropathy, then it should be a clear presentation and targeted treatment. Remember I said, it'll be more clear if it's a peripheral nerve than dermatomal. And that's, we go after it aggressively. But so far we've had fourth and fifth. We don't know where in the fourth we have that. So that's ulnar nerve, maybe dermatomal. And then we give them a radial nerve intervention because there was radial nerve sensation changes. And then there were second session because we weren't clear enough in our initial evaluation. If it is a, um, on the fourth session, that's when we treat the neck with UPAs. I don't know how long they spent with it um, because it's not documented or billed, but under the assessment, they said they did it. So my guess is it wasn't done for very long. However, it does specifically say the, the results of it, that the time to onset of symptoms and um, decreased and the decreased amount of time required to recover. 
Um, so it, it improved both of those is, is what it was saying, that it improved how long it took to come on and then they were able to recover more quickly. So salient features. The radial nerve was treated when it was documented numbness and tingling and possibly the ulnar nerve distribution, but this wasn't clarified. So we hit that already pretty well. We need to clear the neck better and UPAs improved her, uh, her functional comparable sign. It sounds like it's a double crush to me based on those salient features. So decision point, the first one. At the initial exam, we learned that she has a previous surgery. She lifts weights and has forearm symptoms that seem nerve-related. A differential should include these. Should be at the first, but when you real, if later if you're messing up, go back and you know write all these down. Single diagnosis of peripheral mononeuropathy, something cervicogenic, brachial plus, plexus, distal polyneuropathy. So remember, we had the ulnar and radial findings, or a combination of any of these. Remember, Hickam's dictum, they can have more than one problem. There are a number of different routes to take here, and that the nuance of the situation would dictate. So I don't know, with those many possibilities, it's hard to say where it would go. Here are the principles, though. You identify the main impairment and identify the comparable sign that you'll measure. The next step is crucial. How will you measure if it's effective enough? So this is determined by three things. So you want to know, are we on the right track? Degree of, of plausible physical mechanism, the severity of the impairment that you find, and the severity of competing impairments. So remember those three things. When we're trying to see if we help them, because a lot of times something could be helpful a little bit. Um, but you want to know, you know, by treating this, is it actually, does it make sense that this is helping? Does it make sense that this problem could cause all this? And what else are the other things that could be causing, you know, that we're seeing impairments and how significant are they? So the second visit, we really need to take these steps into account. Um, and subsequently as well, but it's most pronounced in the second visit. So on visit four, on visit two for everybody, that's a general, that's the principles. So here's decision point two. On visit four, there is improvement in the functional asterisk signed by treating the neck. Especially in lack, in light of lack of improvement, treatment was, was not changed to treating the neck. So they've been treating peripherally. They weren't getting better. They treat the neck. They have a little bit of improvement. But then the plan of care wasn't changed. This is the definition of anchoring, that you ignore new salient features that don't fit in line with what you were thinking. And so they, they anchor on what it, even when it's not lining up. So decision point three, a discharge. At what, and so she had improved a little bit. What was it? Um, 61 to 65. And they anticipated only two weeks. So two weeks, they just went with it anyway. So this is the criteria for discharge when we're saying that somebody's done. somebody. It seemed like that she was at two weeks and they planned on two weeks. So they, they were done because that was what the plan, original plan was and that they didn't hit all these things. Now this is discharge if we assume that they're done and we're not referring them on to somebody else. So number one, the patient and the PT are confident that they will continue to improve or maintain their status with their HEP. The patient or number two, the patient and PT is confident they don't need further interventions or other office visits. So if they're thinking, well, I think I may still need to go elsewhere, you need to check. Do they think they still need to go back somewhere and get an injection or have a surgery or are they planning on doing other things, you know, because it's not all the way there. Unless you're saying, yes, you need to go there. Sometimes we, you know, we don't get there and we say, you need to go do this. But we need to know the plan and they shouldn't be trying to create their own plan when they're done. And the patient knows what to do if their symptoms flare up again. So basically we need to know. You and they both need to be confident that they can continue to progress or if they're already as good as they're going to get, you know, stay where they're at and that they know what to do if they're going to flare up or if they need to see somebody else, you and they, the patient both need to know the plan for that. And they don't need to be like, well, I wonder what's next. You know, it's not all the way there. I wonder if a surgery would help or an injection or an ablation or pain management or a pill or a chiropractor. And such. Unless you're instructing them to do that, now, they may choose to do that, but you need to address it that what you think will be helpful and what will not. In this case, there's little, little evidence to believe that all three of these were met. Factors that could affect this are skepticism that the person would make sufficient improvement. So maybe the, you know, the therapist is like, I don't think they're going to get all the way there. We made a little bit. That's as much as we're going to get. Um, it could have been financial. The person did have a copay. Maybe this is all that they wanted to be able to hit. 
or be able to do or could do. Um, and the initial expectation that care would only be two weeks. You know, maybe we said, hey, we'll do this in two weeks. Yep, you made a little improvement. Good luck. Um, we need to take these. We need to take these head on. If there's a problem, you know, we if we're skeptical, we may be correct. Some people don't get there, um, but it's easy to be skeptical they won't get there when we haven't done a, a good enough job, don't having a robust differential diagnosis, and then vetted out each of the diagnoses. Case eight: numbness and tingling in the tips of all the fingers on both hands, left worse than right. It's a female in her seventies. It's been going on for a year, and they set goals for six weeks away. There's no copay. We didn't get a final one, but I thought this and mo all these other ones are fine. They, there was a final one. She went from a 65. It was she was at a 65. Expected her to get to a 75, um, but I thought it was an instructive one anyway. So the notes is bilateral upper extremity paresthesis. It couldn't could indicate cord compression, indicating to look for myelopathy, which you should if you're considering myelopathy, which the therapist it looked like did. We should be testing lower extremity reflexes. It's a good habit to get into because sometimes it'll show up when other things don't. Um, if there's any question, a modified JOAC MEQ is very sensitive. Um, if the reflexes would have been not hyperreflexic on this person, um, then a JOAC MEQ probably wouldn't be indicated because the patient is. Um, they have hyperreflexic bicep, biceps, but not hyper lower down in the C-spine, you know, as we test uh, C7. Um, and then the C in Hoffman's was negative. Ankle clonus is also negative. It's unknown if the neck is involved. My guess is it's not, but it's not documented clearly enough to know. It likely would need trial treatment with aggressive home exercise program to really know. There's likely no test to know if it would have improved or not. Nerve tensioners are most effective for mononeuropathies. This person may have multiple mononeuropathies, or they may have a polyneuropathy, or maybe they just don't notice exactly which fingers their symptoms are in. Regardless, looking systemically is important for either just central sensitization or for a biomedical cause like radiation, etc. The salient features. Patient has bilateral upper extremity symptoms and central canal myel so that's central canal stenosis, so myelopathy or bilateral foraminal stenosis wasn't investigated heavily enough. So decision point one on the third visit. Um, visit two isn't sufficient because she hadn't done her HEP. By visit three, it was sufficient enough data. She is having improvement, but she doesn't know if it's from the interventions in the clinic. This is a common statement people will make. This is where we have to determine how we're going to know if it's from our interventions or not. We need to know when the last time it fluctuated like this. And if there's anything else that would explain the improvement. So if she says, oh yeah, it does it like this. Well, then it may just be fluctuating. Um, or if she's like, well, I started taking this new medication and started getting better. Huh, maybe it was that. Or if she started doing something differently, she started doing another exercise or something. <coughs> well, maybe she gives an explanation <coughs> and, and you don't think it is that. Well, you say, okay, well, I mean, then just be honest. It could be that. Well, maybe it is. You don't think so. I, th you know, say, I think it's more like from this because I typically see these type of results when people do this. Um, how are we going to know, you know, whether it's from this or that, you know, get there. And if they don't have an idea, say, why don't we test it like this? You know, and that way for this, if you keep doing this and you get more improvement or if it stays away long enough, it's probably from this instead of something else. And maybe you won't find that, but you want to look to find, um, that then you both know what it's from on the fourth visit. She's about the same and she's been doing her HEP. There's a chance she just needs more volume. But if we've needled and she's doing her HTP, we should notice some change by this point. It was needled in the extremity. So if we've been doing high power interventions. She's doing what she's supposed to and she's not seeing a change. That's a flag that we're not, we're not making the progress that we anticipated. This is when we need to reevaluate what is on our differential diagnosis list. Have we missed? And then we need to investigate it heavily enough. If we didn't and initially, then we need to do it now. Sometimes we'll get into it like, man, we didn't do a good enough job early on. Okay, then relook, see what we missed, and then go after it aggressively. The patient's got to know their comparable signs. 
and they also need to know how we're going to know if the change of, of the plan is helping or not. Case nine, bilateral shoulder pain and weakness. We have a female in her early 80s. The duration is for three months for this episode, but had a debridement 30 years ago, um, which is probably not that important, but that means there's been a history of, of pain there, and she might relate it to that injury initially, and it may be related. Um, they put the, so there's three months for this episode and eight weeks later for the goals. Anticipated uh, she would go from a 51 to a 63, but she only got to a 61, so she was almost there. So this patient has a long history of pain. Spinal cord stimulator, five back surgeries, several areas of pain. She has an oxygen tank. She would like to return to manicuring. This was not documented in her goals, just in the subjective. That's a that's the unique goal for a female in her early 80s. It's a unique goal for really for anybody, but she wants to return to that. We need to make that a, a goal. And if we don't think she can get there, then we could put poor prognosis for that or just fair prognosis. But we need to note that. Um, the neck is not assessed on day one found midway through and then in midway through the plan of care it's found out the treatment episode that she has anemia uh, much of the plan of care is focused on her ability to walk more having multiple issues is a challenge particularly with photos so if they do it on one thing that's part of the problem but we end up focusing on something else it's not it was, we just we need to treat the patient in front of us right um, but we can combine a lot of things for helping them improve function and there's no indication why she stopped coming at least in the notes so the salient features, patient made progress with a lot of activities and exercise. If we look at what we're measuring in photo, more than it will allow us to target our in intervention. So maybe if we just said, oh, this is what, you know, it asked, her, let's make sure we replicate that in the, in the clinic or ask her how it is at home to make sure we're making progress on that. It also helps our discharge planning. She wasn't measured on her last session. It was, I think, the second to last. Maybe if we'd done the last one, she would have hit the 63. So if we just, particularly with photo, this is less about decision making in the session with her although there's a little bit that we could have maybe targeted a more well making sure that we get photo and we're looking did we hit the goals there um we didn't evaluate the neck maybe she would have gotten there in that amount of time or less if we'd evaluated the neck so it's another case where she wasn't reporting pain but anytime there's a problem with the neck or range of motion or pain there it can affect a lot of things and maybe that would have helped her if we'd have looked at that but no major decision points here. She progressed pretty steadily. She just didn't get there. And there was a few things that we left out of like targeting treatment and looking at the neck. So the primary complaint with this next person was shoulder pain and hip pain. There were separate photos for both. It was a female in her mid forties. Um, it was unknown. I don't know how long it was there, but um, she was in her office two years ago for hip pain. Um, and the goals were set for six weeks away. There's a $31 copay. The shoulder um, was expected to go just a little bit up from a 76 to a 78, but she actually dropped a little bit. It can be tough. We're expecting to go up just by a little. That Maybe there was a little bit of error, so it can be tough to get those um, for sure. Hip was expected to go from a 62 to an 80. That was expected to have a big jump. She had a moderate jump, a um, little bit over halfway, but she didn't get there on that one either. So this one we're going to be able to hit a little bit of lower extremity lumbar as well, but lumbar was only palpated for clearing. So the only thing it talked about clearing for it was palpated. Um, no cervical screening was done. So they came in for shoulder and hip pain, and neither of them did we attest the joints above and below. This is a challenge when we try to do two things at once. It's easy to do both of them poorly. Um, no rotator cuff testing was done. It's hard to argue more was done but not documented since the person had minimal improvement. Even though at the end it was documented the patient had made objective improvement was noted, but there was no actual objective measures that um, they tested that were improved. Um, pain and activity and increased activity level were what were what they said were improved. Um, so the salient features is poor objective measures leading to poor way to measure for improvement. And so it led to just exercising in the clinic and hoping that being good personal trainers essentially would lead to improvement. And two things that importantly led to two failed photo scores. Here's the crossroads. Mistakes at the beginning need to be caught on subsequent sessions. There was no one session where they should have been caught. We should just realize, wow, we don't actually know what we're measuring. Did a poor job the first time, had a little bit of a brain lapse. Then we got to go get asterisk signs and make sure it correlates to their functional activity they're struggling with. So we need objective ones and then ones that she's dealing with and make sure that they feel and we feel that 
working on those in the clinic will then help them in what they need in their daily life. And they need to know why we're measuring it. So again, no specific session should have been done. Obviously, ideally first, but if you miss it, just go get it. When you realize, I have no idea how I'm noting if this person's improving. And that's why it's led to just exercises. Case 11, left shoulder pain, male in his mid-30s. wasn't documented how long it had been there for, but goals were for eight weeks away, no copay. Went from a 45 to a 61, or expected to get to a 71. Should be noted that in the plan of care, it was documented that this person needed more. Um, um, but they but they had to move um, out of the city. Imaging showed a 10 to 6 slap tear. So we have imaging showing pathology in the shoulder. And he reports it happened during bear crawl and physical training with military. I the, So the question here we need to know is, was it actually during that? Or did he just notice pain later? He went and got an MRI and it showed a slap tear. And he assumes it was from that. I'd be surprised if bear crawl caused a slap tear. It's a possibility. But... If he was strong enough to be doing that, and then all of a sudden it just gave way, my guess is that it wasn't a traumatic mechanism injury, um, but it, it, it could have been. Maybe he fell with it. We, we just don't know, um, at least based on the notes. And the neck was not screened. Um, and even if it was traumatic, unless it like dislocated during it or something, then maybe he tweaked his neck during it, and he fell it into his shoulder, and his neck resolved, and so he's still just complaining of shoulder pain. Um, and even if it's not the primary pain generator, maybe it's a contributing factor. Um, so what we would have, easy way to clear it here, when it, we have imaging, especially if there was a traumatic mechanism injury, and even if there's not, if there's no, if he's not reporting any neck pain, I don't know if it was asked about, but if he's not reporting any, you do overpressure, flexion, and at least quadrant. You know, and watch, I'd like to watch him move it each way, but at least over pressure, 10 seconds in flexion and a quadrant um, each way. And if he's having no symptoms in his neck or anywhere else with that, then we could say it's clear. That would take less than a minute and it would give us a lot of good information. And even if it isn't clear, that doesn't mean it isn't necessarily the primary pain generator or even a primary impairment, but it could be. And we need to investigate it more and you won't be able to just clear it out in a minute if they have any pain with that. Um, so saline features, the patient made progress and was, um, with his, with his HEP and everything is being modified appropriately. At one point, the patient, this is a crossroad, then the patient came back and was, became constantly sore. So you'll find this when they're doing well, but then they become constantly sore. Um, you know, that's an inflammatory reaction. We need to, we need to deload them a little bit and it did improve. So this person may have gone there, even though they missed the neck and maybe it was all right that they missed the neck. They may have gotten there with more time, but again, it's we want to make sure we're screening the joints above when it's particularly the neck when we're dealing with shoulder issues. Um, case 12, there's shoulder pain and widespread pain. Male in his early 50s, two years. Um, it's been going on, but it's been worse over the last six months. Um, goals are set for eight weeks away. No copay. He went from a 34 to a 35. 38, but is expected to get to a 59. So it's documented that the patient has shoulder and neck impairments um, that, that both improve when treated at the neck and the shoulder. Remember we talked about which one's more salient. If it's neck or shoulder, the neck is going to be more salient. Um, he's also working hard in the clinic. Visit 8, the CSI is done instead of 62. So even after all the treatment we've done, he still has a high 60, a high CSI. Typically, it doesn't change that much. So if it was any higher before, it probably wasn't much higher. Um, he does note, you know, thankfully that he noticed that he's a high stress individual and that it contributes to his pain. It's at this, it's at this point that he's noting not much improvement on, in his symptoms, which is probably why the CSI was given, but all the objective measures are improving. At session five, he had improved from 35 to 40 on photo. Each of the first six sessions, manual cervical manual therapy is done and he's making objective progress. And he got to the 40 on the photo in the first five. It's at this session, it's noted that he guards significantly. So that's when they notice he guards significantly. I don't know if he just started guarding then or if it'd been there the whole time and then the therapist didn't think it was helping because he was still guarding. Um, I'm not sure. But session seven, there's no spine manual therapy. And it's, but it's noted that motions are improving, but right rotation still causes scapular pain. Visit nine, photo is back down to 34. So remember, we started 34, went to 40, back down to 34. Um, visit 11, a discussion on getting an MRI and having a shoulder replacement is discussed. 
Objective measures of cervical range of motion and myotomes are not updated in this note. If scapula and neck pain improves, cervical range of motion and myotomes improve, and shoulder passive range of motion improves, but shoulder active range of motion does not improve, then it's more likely that a TSA would be helpful. So let's go over that, that, that little part again. So if we treat his neck and we get a lot of different, you know, we get the neck is improving, myotomes are improving because a replacement won't help myotomes improve. And if he had myotomal weakness, then we need to make sure we get that clear because if we don't get that clear, maybe the symptoms in the shoulder are not from the arthritis. And then maybe shoulder range of motion will probably improve a little if that those do improve. Maybe it's passive, maybe if it's active. Sometimes severe arthritis, you won't get passive range of motion to improve enough. But it needs to be, It's those are the ones where it's super um, degenerated. You know, I mean, that's what class people talk about bone on bone. Even, you know, you just get up to that nine, you can feel it grinding. Um, those are the ones where I find that it doesn't improve as much. Um, so the possible explanation of the photo, initially it may have just been feeling positive. It may not have been because of the cervical manual therapy. You know, we felt a little improvement, and then when it didn't keep improving, became a little bit more pessimistic. I find that that happens sometimes. But it, it may be because he's not sleeping well, um, and maybe it's but maybe it's because you stopped the spine manual therapy. So here's some the salient features. Widespread pain that after 11 sessions, it's noticed that maybe he needs a TSA. A replaced shoulder is good for glenohumeral joint pain. I don't know if this person has significant glenohumeral joint pain, um, but he is noticing crepitus in the joint, and a rotator cuff tear would indicate this may be needed. Um, this, this noted he may be one that wouldn't obtain his photo score, so I recognize that even with better care, he may not have attained it if he really does need a replacement. Um, but we don't know because it wasn't looked at well enough and it wasn't consistent enough treatment. There's a few salient features that would make me more confident that he would need a replacement and that the photo score is just not attainable. One is if we'd continued to focus on the spine, could we have continued to see the early gains we were making? Number two, if we'd had specific loading to the rotator cuff and been able to document if strength is able to improve with these specific motions. So he's doing other functional motions, but those can be compensated. But if he cannot make any improvement on rotator cuff motions, well, then we know the rotator cuff is not rehabable. Um, and we don't know if we de did we ever decrease the CSI. We didn't look at it early enough in the beginning. We didn't relook at it later. Um, poor psychological findings indicate worse results with joint replacements. That said, sometimes a joint replacement can help decrease central sensitization. You know, they had all that nociceptive barrage, and it can help. So it's not to rule it out, even if they're high centrally sensitized. But if we, we need to make sure we're looking at everything and we're screening it out well, so they can give them the best recommendation possible. So here's decision point one, your crossroads. At visit seven, we stopped spinal manual therapy because he's guarded. So we did that first six, we didn't do it visit seven. This didn't line up with the objective measures we were finding. Why is he object improving objectively, but not subjectively? And so that's where we need to look and see, is he just, is he trying to increase activity? Is it a, is it a di difference in communication? Is it his perception? Why are we finding objective but not subjective improvements? It's tempting to want to move on. Okay, if this isn't doing for us, let's go on and get be more active. But the man is in poor health and has a lot of problems. Any improvements is a good sign. The fact that we're making objective improvements means we're going in the right direction. Sometimes we see the objective before they get the subject. And if we'd have looked at photo, that's kind of that cross between objective and subjective. It's reported, but we have a standardized, um, you know, that we can measure it. Then that's improving. So we, sh we should have kept with that. Visit eight, we find his perception of improvement is not lining up with his objective findings. This means there's a problem with the comparable signs. So three possibilities, four possibilities. I wrote three, but then I end up writing down different four, four of them. The clinic comparable signs are not appropriate and will never correlate with improved comparable signs at home. So that is, that is a possibility. So if you're seeing improvement in your comparable signs, but they don't feel like they're improving, um, then maybe that they're, they're the wrong comparable signs. Number two is the clinic comparable sign improvement just isn't sufficient enough yet to translate to functional improvement. So maybe they're noticing, maybe their objective improvements are happening, but it's not sufficient enough to make the actual what they're doing easier or less painful. Maybe we don't have enough comparable signs. So, you know, I put, we, maybe the ones we have are appropriate, but we need more to be able to 
be more detailed in what we're measuring. And maybe number four, we're just not communicating well enough. I think that this varies very likely with the patient that I th think there was a number of comparable signs. We just didn't say, is this correlating to this? Well, why is this improvement not at home? We needed to have that discussion. The patient needs to understand which ones are improving and which ones are not improving. So then they know what we're measuring. They need to know what we're measuring. This way we can be very specific with how we measure them and he'll know whether he's improving or not. And he can say, hey, this is better, so I must be doing better. Or this is better, but I'm actually not improving with this at home. Okay, then let's reevaluate what our comparable signs are and what's going on. I want to say that again. So if he notes what we're looking at and then he can say that is not better or it is better, then he needs to be able to articulate it is better and I'm doing better or that is better, but I'm actually not overall feeling better. We need to figure out why. Is it one of those? Then it could be one through three there. But until four is done well enough, then we don't know if it's one through three. And then we would bode well for determining surgery. If he knows that some things are improving, but some aren't, and we're measuring it well, and we can see the cervical range of motion is becoming pain-free, even with overpressure in all directions, maybe shoulder motor passive range of motion is hopefully improving. If not, then it's really crepitous. That would be good to know. Um, shoulder active range of motion and strength didn't. You know, they did shoulder exercises, particularly rotator cuff exercise, and the rotator cuff didn't improve. Well, then, hey, that's, you know, surgery may very well be helpful. So decision point three, on visit 11, when the TSA is discussed, we need to discuss factors for a good prognosis. So regardless of all the other things, whether they progressed them well or not, um, we need to have a discussion. You know, you have a high CSI. Sometimes, you know, how much of the pain is from the shoulder or is it other things that are going on? When everything is hyper, you know, sensitive, you know, is that is that going to be enough or is it going to send other things into more pain? Some people were worried about it and that needs to be discussed or they think, you know what, my shoulder felt better. I just overall be much happier. Okay. Then maybe that, you know, the shoulder replacement will decrease the CSI. Pre-surgical range of motion and pre-surgical strength correlate with post-surgical range of motion and strength. That if it's, if he can only reach up to 90 degrees before and it's real tight or he doesn't have much strength, he's not going to be able to go a whole lot afterwards. A reverse total shoulder average is 105 degrees active range of motion flexion. To regular total shoulder um, is much higher. It's more like the 140, 50 range. Um, that one can achieve better prognosis if they're an appropriate candidate. So we need to discuss those things and say, this is what we're monitoring. So they know what we're looking at so they to know if they have a good prognosis or not. Final case, 13, unilateral posterior neck to shoulder. Um, female in her late 60s, three months duration. I forgot to put how long the goals were set for. There's no copay. She went from a 62 to a 66. We expected her to get to a 71. So she got a little over halfway of the expectation. In the eval, it's noted that cervical range of motion is within normal limits and pain-free. This is an odd finding because of where the pain is at. She has unilateral posterior neck to shoulder pain. And then we say that it was pain-free with cervical range of motion. If I have an odd finding, which we all get odd findings sometimes, we need to document it as such. You know, that I tested it with, we don't say this is an odd finding, we can say I did overpressure, sustained for 10 seconds, it didn't have any symptoms. So that way when somebody's looking and say that's odd, when you look at it later, you're like, yeah, but I did a good job with it. And then you know you don't have to go back to it unless something changes. She only presented to the clinic for three visits over a period of four weeks, but six weeks from the last visit is when she filled out her next photo. So we can't argue that she was doing pretty well and time would just help take care of it. It was 10 weeks overall and six weeks after the last visit, and we didn't make significant enough progress to meet the expected goal. She improved initially, likely because she felt positive, became more active, and it's pretty normal act and she's, pretty, she's normally pretty active and healthy. However, her neck was likely not addressed fully enough, and because her symptoms weren't improving enough, she likely stopped coming. The salient features. So the referral says right shoulder slash scapular pain. That's what the referral from the physician said. And in the subjective part of the note, it says posterior shoulder and upper trap pain. That is, 
those are rare. Those are very, very, very often not shoulder generated pains. So you look right there, you're going to have a hard, hard, hard time convincing me that it is a shoulder specific issue when it's trap and posterior shoulder. Normally shoulder specific issues are lateral and anterior, sometimes just posterior, right? You know, near the glenohumeral joint. But normally it's lateral and anterior, even lateral and anterior come from, come from the neck. But when it's shoulder generated, normally it's lateral and anterior. The patient has no traumatic mechanism of injury. So again, uh, this again increases the chance for a neck issue. Not It doesn't have to be, but it increases the chance. So our pretest probability for having it be cervicogenic, cervicogenic is very high at this point. She said it's from kayaking, but again, that's not a traumatic mechanism of injury. Um, but that could just as easily affect the neck as it did the shoulder. All of these indicate neck, yet the neck looks like it was a cursory evaluated because all it said is range of motion is within normal limits and pain-free. Um, so then the, we did find a significant finding of internal rotation of five degrees, and that was anchored on. And it's, only five degrees is significant. That is a very salient feature. And then the sleeper stretch was given. But again, we want to... We want to remember when earlier we talked about we have to compare, you know, how the Case severity four. of each of them to each other. Primary the plausibility of that this being the male in his mid fifties is bilateral cause pain. of their symptoms. They've been there so for we five months for one cause and then break it out as needed. But the, the cause of financial rotation the, being limited. The, the, no copay. Went from a fifty five to sixty six. Also wording about over muscle use. This was three months ago. That should be relaxed Almost by now. Almost hit it. And internal rotation so should be that painful. And right going into an internal limited range of motion and strength on each side. Session five strength is nearly every time I go reach the that's it hurts. Really the ninth you know, it hurts right there. Okay, well it's then, noted you know, that he has neck like pain and he's instructed to get a referral for his neck. What this patient is presenting. Salient as. features here: shoulders like improve with focus on mobility and strength. You know, kayaking so that was over that's the muscle. The main part of the cause pain for three months later. But then visit and six. Sleeper stretch and side have a shoulder extra rotation will make it go away. Having pain, the posterior shoulder neck was missed before trap pain. This that before this should be evaluated this session. It is likely so not a primary pain generator sounds plausible, you know, for the shoulder. The unilateral, but a little work here would, would have likely unilateral posterior neck likely shoulder, improve his perception of shoulder posterior and you know the scapular score. pain. All the things that put that really high pre-test probability. Case five having that intra rotation. This one had primary complaint of neck pain and unilateral arm probability. As a male in his early visit 30s, three. It's just, it's pain four for weeks six after months. the first visit. This is, this and is the last step eight weeks point. away. She's no she wants 50 more. to 59, expecting to get exactly a 68. That's what that means. So about she wants to feel like she's, remember, she's an active yeah, person. So he had she a radiculopathy pattern. Um, and the pain decreased. We need to reevaluate all of our comparable signs. And realize that we need to go back and look at our differential diagnosis. We're all going to get points where we realize we missed something. No matter how good we get, we're going to miss things. We're going to have brain lapses. We're going to have to go back and Only four of the eight will never be manual therapy performed. The key is to not continue on when we're not making until session five. And they were deemed as normal. This is unlikely. And decrease internal rotation. With the distal symptoms. Are we making progress with internal rotation? If so... Uh -huh. Is her pain getting better? Now, it's not. a couple of, you know, missed the diagnosis. There's a couple the only way to know we're not making the case. Expected Maybe prognosis. Progress. Uh, they had improved. Typically, their prognosis myotomes improved improve before symptoms have multiple do. comparable signs. And, but his symptoms did fluctuate. Now, sometimes so symptoms here's the and myotomes will fluctuate. I've, I've As I look at all back, these, how can and they we were do better? You know, better when we treat stronger, so we start progressing more, and then they came back and they were a little bit worse. Sir, Maybe this, so then I did. Maybe it's something that happened in the life. Evaluated Symptoms initially, and they rarely sufficient again. Enough. So often, so maybe this person's myotomes have just already improved. When it was, it was rarely sufficient and they were worse at enough. first, even though we didn't test them. We and want the to get. There if you're going to say the neck is clear, um, and it you should have I, to be clear I also if you're having though, any upper extremity related symptoms. Um, we don't know. Second we don't know which one it is. And quadrant. Um, he did have hyporeflexia when it was tested. Opposite motion. And um, you sustain them there. biceps. Every once in a while, they won't have any symptoms but, uh, during so it. One time I had a gal. Highly unlikely that my I was doing this, and I marked clear. it as clear. I put ten, in 10 seconds, overpressure quadrant, so no problem. Later, she ended up with a major much more symptoms in her upper patient. extremity. I comes back with anything else that I'd done with her. No symptoms in the upper extremity throughout the session. It was and a so they left response. the Every neck. once in a while, you got late, but just then you'll be able to catch if anything flared them up. And no, no symptoms occur. Carefully. It's very appropriate to say, okay, no symptoms, great. Let's and go out and see if issues, any of these things PT-101 is, is you know, your regional underdependence, evaluated above nothing below, causes it, you can say that I'm not always evaluating the elbow. Then you need to go look at the neck. not unless I notice that it's a little bit bent. If that's not clear, you need to treat the neck until that is clear. Otherwise, it's obvious for them to flare up. It's exactly what happened in this case. Sometimes you'd be doing better, sometimes you'd be doing 
know, and worse. And that. we didn't work to clear the neck. We only treated and remember, when we symptoms had to with cervical spine do not in the session. And the person just kept fluctuating and they didn't reach to where they We just need to gotten. know if there's symptoms. If it replicates the familiar one, those are the easy ones. That's the ones that they come in and say, every time I turn my head, I can feel that. You don't need a D DPT to be able to identify that. That's where we have to be better with our examinations to realize that it could be related. Multiple asterisks or comparable signs um, are needed for each body part that has symptoms that you're treating. So if they, if it's shoulder and neck, and, and maybe they don't have neck symptoms, but you're treating it to see if it's helpful, we need an asterisk sign for the neck. And if there's their shoulder that's problematic, we'll have an asterisk sign, something that bothers it that you can test there as well. Some should be active and some should be passive. This way we have multiple ways we can test it. The patient should know the asterisk signs and know that is what you are testing. Hopefully, and most of the time, they'll agree that the asterisk signs relates to their pain. If it's unknown if, unknown if it does, then at least they'll know what you're, how you're testing if it is. So if you say, do you think, you know, by being able to do this motion with your arm, it'll help you with your problem outside of here? And they say, no, I don't. And But we don't have another better one. You could say, I think it will. Let's find out. I'm going to treat it. And if you get better with that in here when I test it, we'll then go see if, you know, whatever your issue is outside of here, if it's better. If we get this better and what you're complaining of isn't better, we need to reevaluate. But my experience shows that it'll get better. How does that sound? Typically, they'll say, great. They don't have another option. They want to be able to see if it is going to get there. And then they know the plan of how you're going to test which is essentially that you're on the same page. That's the therapeutic, that's part of the therapeutic alliance.